All right, so welcome everyone to our OpenSIM webinar. My name is Jen Hicks. Uh, I am the OpenSIM R&D manager and also the associate director of our National Center for Simulation in Rehab Research, and I'll be serving as the moderator for today's webinar. I'm pleased to welcome today's presenters. Uh, Luca Modenese and Andrew Phillips are joining us from Imperial College in London. Uh, and they will be presenting on interfacing musculoskeletal and finite element models to study bone structure and adaptation. Uh, next slide. Uh, so before we get started, I want to let you know what OpenSIM is in case you're new to the software and community. Uh, so OpenSIM is a freely available software application for visualizing musculoskeletal structures and simulating movements of humans and animals. And so the first goal of our webinar series is to showcase all the research that's being performed around the world with OpenSIM. Uh, OpenSIM is also a large and diverse community of users. And so we also want to have the webinar series serve as a platform for the OpenSIM community to uh, communicate with each other and form new collaborations. Next slide. Uh, a couple reminders. Uh, we definitely want to uh, have a discussion and answer your questions, but we'll do those at the end of the presentation using the Q&A panel. Um, you can also look at the guide on our website or send us a chat or email if you're having any technical difficulties with the webinar platform. Uh, next slide. So now I'd like to go ahead and introduce our speakers for today. Uh, so Luca Modenese re received his PhD in biomechanics in 2013 from Imperial College. Uh, and then since 2017, he's, um, he was awarded an Imperial College Research Fellowship. Uh, and there his current work focuses on how to create patient-specific models from medical images. Um, and also on how to employ them to support preoperative planning of orthopedic surgeries. Uh, Luca was also a visiting scholar here at the NCSRR in 2013, I believe. Uh, and he's an active contributor to the OpenSIM community, so we're excited to have him as a presenter today. Uh, and then uh, Luca is joined by Andrew Phillips. Uh, he leads the Structural Biomechanics Research Group at Imperial College, and he specializes in the development of combined musculoskeletal and finite element modeling approaches. So we're really excited to have you guys join us. Uh, and with that, I'll let you take it away. And don't forget to unmute. Uh, Hello. Can, oh. Yep. Now I can hear you guys. Perfect. Okay. Uh, thank you, Jen, for the introduction. So, I'm uh, I'm Luca. Oh, the, the slide is not working. Wait. Okay. Uh, thank you, Jen, for the introduction. I'm uh, I'm Luca Modenese from uh, Imperial College, and I'm here with uh, Andrew Phillips to show you some of the uh, methodologies that we developed. Uh, uh, to interface uh, massa skeletal and finite element models in the past. Uh, so the reason why <clears throat> we developed this is uh, uh, because we wanted to enable the, the use of the results of massa skeletal simulations uh, to set up further analysis at tissue level. So for, for instance, uh, uh, computing the loads on a, a lumbar vertebrae uh, during a, a lift task or um, evaluating the effect uh, on the bone structure of uh, a specific activity, like for instance, could be um, stair climbing. So, <coughs> just a, a quick overview of what uh, uh, we will present. So, uh, I will just add some uh, uh, motivation to the uh, why is uh, it is of interest to interface musculoskeletal and finite element model, also from uh, a technical point of view. And then uh, um, I'll show you how uh, practically we actually. Uh, combined this uh, uh, modeling environment uh, here in our uh, past studies. And in the second half of the presentation, Andrew will show you some applications to bone structures and uh, uh, adaptation. So <clears throat> if you're watching this webinar, uh, I assume that you are uh, familiar, at least conceptually, with uh, massoskeletal models. Uh, there are computational models uh, based on uh, uh, multibody dynamics. Um, they are generally used, and we use them in our lab as well, for uh, uh, study muscle function and uh, uh, estimating internal body forces like uh, um, the joint reaction forces, for instance, during uh, specific movement. 
in uh, the bioengineering field, another very popular um, technique is uh, uh, finite element modeling. So this is uh, uh, based on a different, uh, it's based on solid mechanics, so um, is uh, is intrinsically different. And uh, uh, it is used to investigate, uh, uh, as, I, as I mentioned before, loads on tissues, so uh, bone, for instance, or, or cartilage. It's been used in the past uh, uh, to estimate the pressure of the uh, hip cartilage. It's, it, it's been used to estimate pressure of the patellofemoral cartilage. That is even being used uh, uh, to estimate the morphogenesis uh, of um, prenatal joints, uh, for instance, in the, um, as you can see in the hip uh, there in the work by Jordi et al. Uh, so uh, just to give you a, a bit of background in case you're, you're not entirely familiar with uh, finite elements, uh, when we when I refer to finite elements, I I speak I mean I refer to uh, a structural application of the finite element technique, and the finite element model as uh, we use it is composed by uh, a geometrical um, geometrical component. Uh, so essentially, the geometry of the structure of interest, and uh, um, I, I want to include in this component also the discretization of these uh, geometries that is necessary to apply the finite element uh, method in itself. Uh, then there is uh, um, the necessity of including uh, material properties, so a description of the material properties of the tissues of interest, and these uh, um, are uh, generally parameters that come from uh, uh, experimental testing of the uh, biological materials. Uh, in order to set up uh, a to set up uh, a finite element model, what is necessary after that is uh, uh, to um, impose some boundary conditions. So uh, impose some constraints to the model that prevent uh, the rigid motion, the rigid translations and rotations. And uh, uh, finally, some external forces can be applied. The <clears throat> once the finite element model is, uh, is uh, finalized, uh, it is possible to run the simulation and uh, uh, obtain strains and stresses. Uh, just to point out explicitly some of the differences between these two modeling environments, uh, when we're um, using massoskeletal models, we use models that are composed by rigid bodies, while uh, when we're using finite element models, uh, the bodies that we are uh, using in the simulations are deformable, as you might have understood by now. Uh, the simulation in themselves are also different. When we are running massoskeletal simulations, we are running dynamic simulations generally, and uh, uh, unless we're doing fancy things with uh, quantum modeling or uh, predictive simulations, they tend to be computationally not too demanding. Uh, the finite element uh, models, on the other hand, uh, they tend to run on quasi-static simulations, and uh, they, uh, they also tend to become computationally demanding uh, quite quickly. Um, finally, uh, another aspect uh, relates to equilibrium and the forces. So uh, massoskeletal uh, bodies in the, uh, the bodies in the massoskeletal models are uh, equilibrated at all frames, and the forces applied on those bodies are uh, applied on points, generally. While uh, uh, in the case of the finite element models, uh, we have boundary conditions to equilibrate uh, the model, and uh, uh, the loads can be applied in, in different ways, so forces, pressures, or even displacements uh, can actually be applied. So considering these differences uh, between the two uh, modeling environments, uh, you might wonder, uh, if there is a technical uh, benefit also in interfacing uh, these two different techniques. And uh, I will uh, answer to this by focusing on two main aspects. So the first one is uh, uh, relates to the boundary conditions. So as I mentioned before, um, the boundary conditions, the constraints, uh, 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 there are constraints that prevent rigid body motion, but they, um, what I didn't mention is they also influence uh, the flexion and strains on the, of the bony structures that are uh, analyzed. So uh, it has been shown in the literature that uh, <coughs> the choice of these uh, uh, boundary conditions can actually influence these uh, uh, deflection and strains and can uh, um, move them out basically from the uh, physiological uh, ranges if they're chosen inappropriately. Uh, previous work by, done by Andrew actually uh, I've tried to overcome this, um, uh, this problem by uh, using so-called free boundary conditions uh, where um, the, the bone structures were basically laid into a, a bed of springs and the springs had uh, anatomical uh, geometries and they behaved like passing muscles. Uh, but you'll, you'll see that if we interface uh, 
musculoskeletal models, instead of using fixed, fixed technique, we have further advantages. Uh, the second reason why uh, there is an advantage in uh, interfacing the two modeling environments is because uh, um, it is being shown again in the literature, uh, mainly uh, in studies focusing on the femur, uh, that uh, <coughs> it's very important to include in the simulation uh, the muscle actions. Otherwise, the strain and the displacement uh, uh, on the bone structures are outside physiological ranges again. It's also being shown that these uh, uh, forces do not to have to be too simplified, so they have to be uh, representative of the uh, muscle action. And uh, um, ideally, actually, they should be applied not on single nodes, but on, on surfaces. And uh, there you see uh, um, actually a picture of the muscle standardized femur in, uh, in the work by Polga. Um, <coughs> So uh, if we consider the two previous points, and now uh, we imagine uh, to extract uh, a body from the musculoskeletal model, say the, the femur, like in this case, um, we can immediately understand uh, uh, the convenience of applying uh, the force set that is acting on, on this body to a finite element model. So <coughs> this force set, first of all, is, uh, as I mentioned before, equilibrated at all the simulation frames. So it will not impact uh, the, the boundary condition that much because uh, uh, it's already equilibrated, so the reaction forces acting on uh, those boundary conditions will be very low. Um, and uh, uh, we can see into details that this force set is composed by uh, muscle forces, uh, first of all, and uh, joint reaction forces and uh, external forces. Uh, so it is uh, um, important to notice that uh, the, the uh, muscle forces, for instance, so the, the muscle geometry can be as complicated as the, the user uh, wants to implement it in a model and, uh, um, I mean, and as, as discretized as possible. So it is also uh, kind of addresses the, the first issue. Uh, it's also very important to, to point out that this force set uh, uh, can be validated against measurements from uh, uh, instrumented prosthesis. So, um, there is a, a sort of a validation of the mechanical environment uh, that we, we can transfer from the musculoskeletal model to the finite element model. Uh, so <coughs> with, this, uh, um, with this introduction, uh, I will now uh, describe you how um, in the past we practically, um, in, uh, we practically applied the equilibrated force set from uh, uh, the bodies of the uh, musculoskeletal model into a, a finite element model. And uh, we did this uh, um, uh, at the femur, uh, especially, but also on other, on other bones after uh, the first study. Uh, so the first aspect to um, focus on is, uh, is geometry. And uh, um, in, uh, for us, uh, is, uh, is uh, worth highlighting that the consistency of bone geometry in the musculoskeletal model and uh, in the finite element model was uh, one of the key aspects in this uh, interfacing. You can see here, a, a walking stride that was uh, uh, simulated, and you can see a muscle standardized uh, femur that was placed into the model and then used in the finite element uh, in the finite element simulations. Uh, so when we did that work, it was um, uh, relatively hard to uh, uh, change and remap all the all the muscles. Um, but now there are a um, few tools like uh, NMS Builder and the Map Client. Uh, they actually allow you to um, build consistent finite element and musculoskeletal models. So it, it is, uh, um, it is uh, uh, possible uh, to, um, to sort of tick this box uh, of the geometry um, in a relatively easy way, uh, especially if you're doing um, subject-specific modeling where you derive the bone geometry both from the MS musculoskeletal model and the finite element model from, from images. Um, in this respect, we also, um, as, a, as an output of my work uh, as a postdoc at the University of Sheffield, we published recently uh, a codified pipeline, so a, a highly uh, detailed sort of procedure to generate uh, musculoskeletal models from uh, uh, MRI images. And uh, you can find uh, at the link that is uh, uh, visible there, you can find uh, uh, material with the guide and uh, MATLAB code to apply this, uh, this procedure. Um, so after the geometry, let's, um, let's have a look at, the, uh, at how we uh, transfer the force set as well that we, we showed being uh, the main, uh, uh, the main uh, aspect that we want to replicate in the finite element model. Um, so um, 
first of all, uh, uh, muscle forces. So in order to extract and apply the muscle forces from the musculoskeletal model to the finite element model, um, during my PhD, uh, we implemented a, a custom plugin, uh, which allows you to, uh, to do this operation. Uh, you can download it from synthetk.org, and uh, it's currently compatible with OpenSIM 3.3, but we're planning to update it uh, as soon as possible. Um, so in terms of uh, applying uh, muscle forces, uh, obviously the magnitude is, is computed uh, through uh, simulations, like uh, using static optimization, for instance, or CMC. Uh, but there is an aspect that needs uh, attention and is uh, um, and are basically muscles that include via points and wrapping surfaces in their uh, geometry path. Uh, so via points and wrapping surfaces are used uh, to improve uh, the anatomical accuracy of, uh, of a muscle path. Uh, you can see it, for instance, on the right, how a medial gastrocnemius um, is using a wrapping surface to um, wrap, uh, essentially, uh, on, a, on the border of a, of a bone. And uh, um, via points uh, are, have, a similar, have a similar function. You can see it on the, on the left. Um, the reason why uh, these um, uh, features of the geometry path are, um, are a bit tricky in, uh, in this interfacing uh, between muscle skeletal and finite element models is because uh, the action of the muscle as uh, observed uh, at the, uh, as observed, uh, oh, something popular, as observed at the, at the bone surface, so where you would normally apply uh, the force in the finite element model is actually different from uh, um, the effective action that the muscle has on the, on the, uh, body of uh, on that body of, of the of the model so <clears throat> in these situations uh, it is uh, possible anyway to um, to set up a, a, an equilibrated finite element model um, possibilities are simply using uh, the parallax theorem uh, you see there on the button so on the button so uh, just uh, uh, moving uh, the effective uh, attachment so um, the point where the force is applied in order to, uh, and it gives the real sort of action um, with respect to the, the, the body. Uh, so just move this uh, effective attachment on the surface of the bone and uh, applying a transfer moment, or uh, as done, uh, for instance, by Valente in 2017, uh, just implement in the finite element model a rigid beam uh, for the first part of the geometry path and then uh, applying uh, the muscle force there. Uh, some people also implemented uh, wrapping in the finite element uh, environment directly. Uh, we tried that, but we found that it was uh, computationally expensive, at least for, uh, for our applications. Uh, so another uh, set of, uh, another <coughs> typology of forces that you, you want to apply to your uh, um, finite element models are the joint reaction forces. Uh, these forces generally have a large magnitude, so the, uh, several times body weight, potentially. Um, and uh, the way that uh, normally they were applied in the literature was uh, simply by um, applying a force to a node in the correspondence of the, of the joint center. Uh, we didn't like this approach because uh, it, it causes stress concentration uh, in, a, in a node of the, FM, of the FE mesh. And uh, um, therefore we come up with what we call load applicators. So essentially, um, in order to produce uh, a load applicator, what we do is uh, we extrude the, the bone surface uh, in correspondence of the uh, articular um, surface, and uh, we generate multiple layers. Uh, that you can see on the right, uh, there are in, on the right there are only two represented, but we actually generate four of them. And uh, uh, the first two, so the closer to the uh, to the bone of interest, are uh, assigned cartilage um, material properties and the external ones are assigned bone material properties. And then uh, what we do is we connect uh, all the nodes of the load applicator to a node that is uh, in the same location as the uh, joint center, the hip joint center in this case, but it's not connected to the, to the bone mesh. Uh, we connect it using trusses element, uh, truss elements generally. And then we apply the force there. So uh, the effect of the force on the, uh, on the articular area is uh, just to apply, um, is, is to apply a pressure, uh, and it's more similar to uh, what happens in the in the actual uh, hip joint, for instance. 
uh, we applied this to uh, several, uh, uh, well, to the lower limb mainly, so to the femur uh, and the pelvis and the, uh, and the tibia. And you can see how it, it tends to, um, yeah, it's a technique that can be applied uh, generally. Uh, the other uh, set of forces that we, we wanted to include also if uh, generally they have uh, they don't uh, have a, a very large contribution was the external forces so gravity and uh, uh, and the inertia forces and uh, uh, we did this by connecting all the nodes of the um, of the model with uh, a node that is in the same location as the center of mass of the of the segment, uh, I mean, it's, uh, of the musculoskeletal, um, of the musculoskeletal segment, basically. Uh, so we applied these forces, <coughs> and finally, uh, we end up with our uh, final finite, uh, well, with the final sort of uh, setup of the finite element model, where all the loads um, from the musculoskeletal segment are applied to the uh, finite element model. Uh, we use the, we, we move, uh, well, we transform all of them in the local reference system. And uh, um, even if we have uh, transferred all the forces to, um, to the finite element model, we still have, still have a quasi-equilibrated force set because uh, uh, the deflections of the uh, finite element model um, causes, they cause basically changes in the moment arm of the applied forces, and that uh, causes uh, um, well, it makes makes the force set not uh, in fully equilibrated. So <coughs> uh, boundary conditions are, are still needed. And uh, um, this approach has a, a limitation, which is uh, that the muscle forces, at least uh, how we, I mean, in our uh, version of this technique, the muscle forces are still applied in, uh, in single nodes. Um, I just want to conclude by uh, mentioning that this is our approach to uh, generated finite element model from uh, uh, master skeletal models, but um, I just want to point you to a uh, few uh, other works that uh, presented similar approaches or entirely different approaches, actually. Uh, so the most notable ones are from Van der Bogert's group uh, from uh, Halon and Adult in 2017, and uh, uh, from uh, uh, Valente and uh, um, the, the Bologna group in 2017. So with this, I conclude the first half of the talk, and I pass the microphone to Andrew for uh, some applications of the finite element models that I show you how uh, set up. Yeah. Uh, so thank you very much, Luca, and thank you, Jen, for the introduction. So I'm just going to talk about probably the unique feature uh, that we do as a group which is this idea of structural bone adaptation. So the techniques can be applied to continuum mechanics adaptation as well, uh, but I'll focus on the structural side. So I'm gonna begin really with the story of how we came to this idea. So every time I look at bone, I can see very clearly with the background in structural engineering that to me, this looks like a structure. So it's a network of, um, shell or plate elements and then trusses or beams uh, struts depending on your perspective so this is the way it's been viewed by anatomists engineers and surgeons at least since the late 1800s so we can see here representations by von meyer wolf and then koch through the ages um, and the main thing that all of them picked up on through observation was that they identified that they believed that bone formed along the main stress trajectories uh, of tension and compression. So you can see that featuring in all of the diagrams from their works here. So this is um, a sort of story that started back in 2011 um, when I had a final year undergraduate project student who tried just for a single slice through the proximal femur, so through the femoral head, the femoral neck, and the greater trochanter, tried connecting up the cortex, which in this case we can just see with plain strain elements around the outside, with a series of beam elements running from one side to the other. And all that he was looking at was the simple load case, so the maximum uh, during walking, was to try and assess which parts we believe were under tension and which parts were under compression. So you can see here the red areas were those that we found we thought were under tension, 
and the blue areas are those we thought were under compression. So that started really the direction that we've gone in since then and improved, we hope, quite dramatically with the introduction of musculoskeletal modeling into the process as well. So our actual bone adaptation is a very simple setup. So it goes on the basis of Frost's mechanostat. So essentially, if strain is above a target, we increase the amount of bone material in a particular region of the model. If strain is below a target, we decrease the amount of bone material, so resorption and apposition. We define a lazy zone around a target strain, so that's where we don't do anything to the bone material, we leave it in the homeostasis effectively. And then finally, we do include a dead zone, which actually involves complete removal of bone material as well. So I can outline the process a little bit, or the difference between continuum and structural bone adaptation. So in continuum modeling, uh, this has the advantage that often the initial model can be based on CT. So I'm sure several of the audience members will be familiar with the idea of taking grayscale from the CT um, information and then converting that based on empirical data sets to give a Young's modulus value. It's reasonably efficient uh, in terms of the computational modeling process. But one of our main concerns is that this doesn't represent either directionality or structure within the bone. Structural modeling, on the other hand, can be based on micro CT. So I'm going to present it at a scale rather higher than that, um, which means that it can be more efficiently run on a standard desktop machine. Um, and for us, we operate at this idea of a meso scale. So this is where the individual elements, and you can see, for example, they're a beam element, um, are slightly larger than the individual trabeculae would be in reality. But we believe overall we capture the behavior at the organ level or at the individual bone level. So these are kind of issues that we've encountered, whether we're doing continuum modeling or structural modeling. So continuum modeling uh, we did do originally, and we found that the orthotropic approach was definitely a significant improvement on isotropic. But the main thing that we found that we've applied in all of the research since then is that in order to get a reasonable prediction, you really have to include several load cases. So by this, I mean different activities but different frames during those activities. So this is obviously something that musculoskeletal modeling is particularly suited for. Um, and we do that instead of applying a single load case, as I illustrated in the slide before. On the structural modeling side, we do have a few limitations that I should sort of declare up front. So one is our current adaptation process uh, maximizes stiffness, and it does that by prioritizing axial force over bending moment resistance. And the other thing to mention is that increasingly those who are looking at the microstructure of bone have found that actually structural motifs might present a compromise between this idea of stiffness adaptation and actually a more kind of robust approach. So meaning that damage to a particular structure won't result in um, immediate failure of that structure. So Villette has published quite a lot of information um, as a former PhD student and then postdoc in the group. Um, and other, work, uh, other groups at Imperial have actually looked at this motif aspect. So moving on to looking at the structural adaptation of the femur and pelvis, so I'm going to outline the process using a pelvis model and then go back and discuss the results that we have for each. So this is really a recap of what Luca was talking about. So for us, we take the bone surface geometry and that's obviously what's used within the FE model and the musculoskeletal model. We generate uh, internal structural mesh. So the outer elements we model as shell elements and the inner elements we model as either beam or truss elements, depending on the simulation that we're running. And what you can see is just a zoomed in view there um, of this really quite randomized mesh that we start off with initially. We add uh, the ligaments into our FE model, and that's obviously something that we're looking to bring further information across from MSK models in the future. 
and then we go through the process of collecting gait recording, uh, gait recording rather, um, performing the musculoskeletal simulations. So generally these are static optimization uh, processes, but they could obviously use other versions. Um, and then we use that for the loading conditions. And what you can also see here are some of the boundary conditions that we would be using as well. So we then start the FE analysis, and this is an iterative process. So the loop that we're running through here is the adaptation. So for a truss element, if, for example, the strain is higher than the target strain, which we've set at 1250 micro strain for the majority of these simulations, we would simply increase the cross-sectional area. If for uh, the cortical element, so those are represented by shell elements on the outside of the model, again, if we had a higher strain, we would increase the thickness of those elements. We do occasionally impose limits um, just to make sure that the model remains rational, but generally, actually, we don't have to impose limits on the sizes of the elements, um, and we still find that the adaptation process produces quite reasonable results. So when we achieve convergence, obviously these are the results that I'm now showing. So the next slide is showing the structural femur adaptation. So on the left, you can see a slice through an, additional, a, an initially randomized mesh. And then on the right, you can see that adapted structure. So the way that I've chosen to show it here is I'm bringing across information from uh, clinical studies just identifying the main trajectories. So you can see that we're picking most of them up. We're also um, picking out features such as Ward's triangle. So that's a region within the femoral neck where actually ve a very low density of trabecular bone is generally observed. So we can be relatively confident that the model seems to be doing what we expect. But obviously, we would acknowledge up front that the validation is always going to be an issue with this approach. So one of the benefits of this approach that Luca touched on um, and that I'm just going to highlight here is that we can obviously look at what activities most stimulate bone in specific regions. So what we have here is obviously the key to the rest of the diagram on here. So the blue areas are showing the slices through the proximal femur here and then through the distal femur here. And then the red lines are indicating the other slices. So we have a slice up through the femoral neck, including part of the greater trochanter, and then a slice down here through the distal condyles. And then the other slices that we see are these then stacked up of the femoral shaft. So what we can see is just a color map of the different activities that are most contributing to stimulating the bone in the different regions. And one of the key messages from this is that while other people have had very good um, predictions of the structure in the proximal femur based on a single load case, so the maximum hip joint force during walking, what we've obviously found is that a number of other activities contribute to the bone structure. So within the proximal femur, within the femoral neck here, and also within the greater trochanter here, we can see that activities such as sit to stand and stair descent have a key role to play. Um, and one of the areas that we're now looking at is the fracture risk, um, effectively of cutting out those activities. So very commonly, um, as people retire, they might reduce the level of activity, they might stop going up and down stairs, or they may even have assistive devices to get in and out of a chair. And so actually our kind of initial hypothesis is that we suspect some of those devices uh, are not necessarily beneficial for reducing fracture risk. So what we can also do is look at the model in comparison to CT images. So all of these images are shown in pairs. So the first two here are for a slice through the proximal femur here. The next pair here are through this slice through the proximal femur, so covering, going through the neck of the femur along the red line here. These two slices are for the proximal femur, so sorry, for the distal femur, so down in the blue slice here, and then finally through the condyles again, just on the red slice here. So what we're most interested to pick up from these is not so much necessarily an indication of the density, 
because that's quite difficult to judge between the meso scale and the micro scale that's coming through a little bit on the CT images, but we are looking to see whether the directionality seems appropriate. So overall, we're relatively happy with the matchup, but obviously there's, there's further work that can go into this. On the pelvis, so that's what I'll show next are the results for the pelvis. While there's a wealth of data uh, within the literature on the proximal femur and on the femur as a whole, there's actually much more limited data on the pelvis. So one of the few studies looking at the idea of trajectories within the pelvis um, is the one in the Journal of Hu Human Evolution that I've listed here. So they identify a number of different bundles rather than trajectories for the trabecular structure. But again, our modeling process seems to be able to pick these up. Although obviously at the scale we're operating at, it's maybe a little bit more difficult to discern the exact directionality of these. We can do the same thing though. So we can look, for example, at the thickness distribution within the cortex. So you can see that on the top row of images here. And we can also look for regions where we expect the trabecular bone to be particularly dense. So we can see that along the bottom row here. And what's interesting is when we then compare these to other studies that discuss uh, particularly cortical thickness, we find really quite a reasonable matchup between our predictions and what's already been observed. The density of the trabecular bone actually reveals quite a lot about the main load transfer paths as well. So you can see particularly the role of the sacrum, for example, here in transferring the load uh, through the spine and then down to both of the hip joints. So we can do the same as we did for the femur. So we find that obviously different activities produce different responses in terms of the regions of the bone that they're most stimulating. And one of the interesting things we found here is, so on the left I'm showing an image of the trabecular bone and on the right an image of the cortical bone. And we were interested by the fact that actually these are not symmetrical. And when we looked back at the musculoskeletal modeling data, we found that this individual had a slight asymmetry between how they carried out certain of these everyday tasks. So it's interesting to see that sort of thing coming through on an individual basis. And again, we can see certain regions uh, that would be expected to be stimulated by walking, but there are other key regions where obviously sit to stand and stand to sit. So for example, down in the ischial part here, have a particular importance. And then we were interested to see that up in the iliac crest, so just where I'm moving the cursor at the moment, obviously stair ascent and stair descent seem to have a particular purpose as well. So just moving on to another advantage of this technique. So this is something that could be done with continuum modeling, but generally requires more advanced um, FE processes. So with the structural model, we can actually 3D print and manufacture um, the structures that we predict. I'm not going to show that just in the interest of time today. But one thing we can do is model bone fracture uh, really quite efficiently. So the process for doing this is very similar to the uh, adaptation process that I've shown before. So we start obviously this time with the converged model from the FE simulations. We convert any elements that we might have into shell and beam representation. So that includes the ligaments as well. And what we do is what we're interested in rather are the different fracture types that might be caused by different loading scenarios. So I'll show one of them in just a minute. So we take the loading conditions from the different fracture scenarios and we run it through an iterative FE analysis again. But this time the iteration is based on a damage elasticity model. So what we do is if the strain has gone above a particular value, we go and we alter the Young's modulus. And you can see in terms of the stress strain curves that we have here, we're actually able to put in different ones for different rates. So as Luca discussed material properties, these are taken from previous tests in the literature, uh, but allow us to define this damage elasticity approach. 
So we go through and bone elements are either um, designated as yielding or actually having reached complete failure. So eventually what we get from this is the fracture pattern and also a distinct failure load. And these are obviously the information that we can compare back to experimental studies, either carried out by ourselves or others. So just for the pelvis, I'll illustrate. Um, so I'm going to go on to show a video for our simulation of lateral compression. But the way that the classification system works is there are three distinct modes of loading or three loading scenarios. So we have lateral compression, which is generally due to a side impact. So in a vehicle collision, this might be one vehicle colliding with the side door of another. We have anterior posterior. So this would be more likely to be one vehicle colliding head on with another. And then finally, we have a process called vertical shear. And this is actually more the type of fracture that might occur um, in either a fall or a jump from height with one leg landing before the other. So the scenario that I'll show is a lateral compression. It's at quite a high strain rate. So on the basis of intensity, we're looking to see whether we would predict somewhere between a type two and a type three. So by intensity, I mean that the strain rate is quite high and that should just run now. So you can see on the left of the slide, we have the force versus displacement curve, while on the right of the slide, we have a animation, which is showing in red, that's an element yielding in tension, and in blue is the element yielding compression. So I'll just run that one more time. And then when an element um, disappears, so that means that it's actually failed completely. So you can see, if you just remember back to the types of fracture, we're definitely getting this, the distinct fracture pattern we would expect for lateral compression. So in this case, the load is coming in from this side, and we're probably quite close to a type three. So we know the type three because we have damage on both sides of the sacrum like so. And we can see actually that we have this very distinct pattern where we have two peaks in terms of the load. So just moving on to a couple of developing areas of application. So we've been lucky enough to collaborate with another group at Imperial uh, to look at baby biomechanics. So this is a really nice application of the approach. So the one additional thing that we need to do with baby biomechanics is obviously we can't get a force plate in there. So we have an additional part of FE at the beginning of this process where we actually look at the displacement of the womb based on a kick here, um, and we use that to assess the kick force. So what I'm showing here are four different conditions. So the normal condition, you can just see the fetus kicking at the moment. Breach and a condition known as oligohydromenos are, so breach is when the baby is essentially the wrong way around. Oligohydromenos is when there's a lack of fluid within the womb, and then finally, twins was considered to be a case. So all of these are potential scenarios where something called developmental hip dysplasia uh, is known to occur later in life. So this is when the hip joint actually hasn't developed properly. And what we were looking at is whether the biomechanical stimulus, so this idea of stress or strain, as I've discussed before, was actually higher or lower in these particular cases. So the interesting finding here was that twins were not significantly different, while actually when we were looking at either a breach or oligohydromenos, we did discover that they were both significantly lower. So this was a kind of nice application, um, and the reason you can see twins have a similar uh, you know, biomechanical stimulus to normal is essentially because they kick each other as well as the lining of the womb. So another couple of areas that we're looking at are um, maintaining bone health in transfemoral amputees. So we're looking at the different loading scenario that this presents. And then finally, we're moving up from the lower limb into the spine. So we're trying to produce subject-specific spine models and beginning to see whether if we introduce a virtual injury, can we see changes within the predicted bone structure 
uh, and possibly even the intervertebral discs as we use similar techniques to those I've outlined. So just to conclude, I hope that we've given you a useful summary of why you might want to interface musculoskeletal and the finite element models. Luca in particular has obviously presented some of the techniques that we've used and applied to try and um, you know, make that interface as solid as it can be. And then finally, we've obviously talked about some applications to bone structure and particularly looked at the idea of structural adaptation. So just to acknowledge all of our collaborators, so we have PhD students and postdocs and heads of other groups here, and obviously to thank the funders who are many and various. Uh, and finally, thank you for your attention and obviously we're uh, open to any questions that you have. Thank you. Luca and Andrew, thank you for that great presentation. Jen, are you on? Oh, sorry, I was my having a, a computer issue there. Uh, so thank you, uh, Luca and Andrew, for the really great presentation. Super interesting work. Uh, now we'll go ahead and take your questions. Uh, so if you have questions for Andrew and Luca, find the Q&A panel. Uh, in your WebEx interface and go ahead and uh, type in your question and make sure you uh, select to ask all panelists. Uh, so we already have some questions coming in. Um, first, there were lots of thank yous from the audience for the really interesting presentation. Um, and a question from Arash Ganapati. Um, so the question um, says, thank you so much for your presentation. I was wondering how did you calculate the area of the femur, the hip joint, to avoid cons concentrating the stress of the node? Does that make sense? Um, uh, sorry, yeah, so I'll, I'll take that one. I, I think okay. it's possibly an FE question. Um, so we, we basically, had to look at what we believe the articular surface would be. Um, and we did have to uh, carry out a number of sensitivity studies where we made sure that actually we weren't artificially over stiffening that region of the femur. So effectively that we weren't kind of applying a helmet to it um, and therefore spreading the load more than would be ideal. Um, there is actually a chapter in Claire Villette's thesis where we look at various different approaches. Um, so that's available online. Um, so I, I would recommend have it, having a look at that. Um, and it goes into a little bit more detail um, about the kind of sensitivities of that approach. Okay, so the follow-up question um, was, why didn't you use foam modeling instead of a beam element and shell? Or why did we use? We mm -hmm. didn't understand. Was that foam modeling? Foam? Maybe it's a typo. Um, so, so um, I mean, I, uh, so it's possible I can kind of venture a suggestion here. So we are obviously looking at um, bone as a lattice structure. I would say the, the big difference between our approach and the general approach to modeling lattice structures that I'm familiar with um, is bones definitely a non-repeating lattice structure. Um, so for that reason, that's why we went directly for the approach of having beam and shell elements. Um, something we are looking at, and I sort of touched on this, is there are various researchers now who suggest that there are motifs within bone so possibly repeating units, um, but they seem to be more based around the nodal unit as opposed to what we would normally consider as a lattice structure unit. Um, so that's definitely something we've got in the pipeline. Um, ho hopefully that's helpful for that question. I'm not sure. Okay. Um, so I'll go ahead and ask a question while we wait for any others to come in. So the results on how different activities affect um, 
the loads that bone experience are really interesting. Did you um, look at all at how the intensity of the various activities affects loading or what, what was the, the kind of intensity level of the, you know, how fast were they walking? Um, how fast were they rising from the chair or sitting down? Um, yeah, so it's, it's a good question. Um, at the moment, the main structural model really just looks at the highest level of principal strain. Mm -hmm. um, so certainly if somebody is doing an activity with a greater intensity, um, obviously the ground reaction force and as a consequence the joint forces and the muscle forces would generally be expected to be higher. Um, so that does come out in the model. Um, some further work, so we're aware the model I've presented today is what we would describe as a phenomenological model. So that really just um, looks at, you know, an idea similar to Frost Mechanostat and drives it with strain. What we have also begun to look at is trying to generate more of a mechanistic model. So this is where we look at a parameter that um, bone cells might actually be able to sense. So something like fluid motion is one we've looked at. Um, and we hope in time that we can use that to look at the free well, the frequency or if you like the, the speed of an activity. So I think probably it will max out at some point if mm -hmm. you, you know, so the fluid simply can't move fast enough mm -hmm. uh, if you're doing a particularly intense activity. Um, so, yeah, again, that's something we'd like to incorporate in the future. Um, and there's, yeah, I, I mentioned a couple of nice papers by Claire Villette that try and apply this to a surrogate modeling approach. So where we would find things um, based on a poor elastic micro scale model and then extract the information in a way that we can then use it in the structural model more directly. Um, so that's just a, an efficiency, um, you know, an attempt at computational efficiency, basically. Okay. Uh, so we have time for a couple more questions. Yeah. Um, next is a question from Nicole Davis. Um, so is your model, is your, she asks, is your method for predicting fracture particularly suited to the pelvis, or do you think it would work as well for other bones like the femur, for example? Um, so, yeah, it, it seems to be suited for, um, yeah, pretty much any bone. Um, so, again, uh, <laughs> I feel like I'm advertising Claire Vallette's work a lot. So, <laughs> she did a lot of very good work um, as a PhD student and postdoc. So, it was actually her who developed the fracture algorithm. Um, and we have, so there's one paper out looking at applying that in the femur. Um, and we should have another paper that we're just submitting, um, which looks at the effect of the external bone shape on possible fracture risk. Um, so that's in collaboration uh, with a group in New Zealand. So hopefully that should appear quite soon. Okay, great. Next uh, question from Matthew Barr. Um, where did it go? Uh, he says, thank you for the pres wonderful presentation an interesting way to distribute the loads on the femoral head. Uh, he was wondering if you plan to apply the model to pathological conditions such as osteoporosis. Um, yeah, so that's, it's definitely an area we're looking at. Um, so particularly some of the work that we're doing for bone health in transfemoral amputees. Um, I, so I need to be quite careful because my expertise doesn't extend to um, other potential causes of osteoporosis. Um, so I don't want to kind of say anything that biologically or chemically, um, you know, would potentially be completely wrong. What, what we're really looking at in that case is conditions that are often referred to as osteoporosis. Um, but we think they may actually be associated with um, a differential in the loading paths. Um, so that is that actually when um, the amputee happens and then during rehabilitation, the um, load stimulus that would be there in an able-bodied person 
simply isn't experienced in quite the same way by amputees. So that's a kind of particular crossover area where they're often diagnosed and told that they have osteoporosis. Um, and what we're trying to do is to see whether actually things might be a bit more hopeful than that. Um, so that they, if they followed a particular rehabilitation regime or maybe loaded um, using not the prosthetic device that they're issued with, uh, whether that would actually stave off um, what appears to be osteoporosis that we hypothesize might be simply a lack of stimulation to specific regions. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, so we have time for one more question. Uh, this is a question from Jordan Cannon, and he or she asks, says, thank you for the great presentation. The importance of including muscle forces in FEA was mentioned. And in the musculoskeletal model, static optimization is typically used. How might various objective functions and other methods influence the resulting bone stress and strain? Um. So um, you can calculate muscle forces in, in different ways. So using cracking simulations or using uh, a synthesizing motion. Uh, in, uh, in the literature it's been shown, there's, there's a paper actually by Brent Edwards, I think, and uh, Ross Miller and uh, someone else, I don't remember, where they compare the, uh, the effect actually of, of uh, um, estimating uh, muscle forces using static optimization and predictive uh, simulation, and they found that uh, the difference wasn't uh, that large. Um, obviously, this was done at the femur. Uh, so um, I guess it's, uh, I mean, is uh, is a difference, uh, as you say, it, it really depends on how a changing an objective function influences actually the muscle recruitment. So. Um, I wouldn't expect uh, massive differences for, say, normal walking uh, with respect to, to different, uh, uh, or yeah, <laughs> or uh, with respect to different, um, yeah, the different techniques to estimate muscle forces. Yeah, thanks, Luca. That makes sense. Um, so I think we'll need to go ahead and wrap up. Um, Thank you everyone for the really great questions. Thank you again to Andra and Andrew and Luca for the really great talk. I think there are a couple closing slides you guys could click through for me. Just a sec. All right. Yep. Okay. Uh, so we took care of questions. The, ne the next slide, um, I want to acknowledge our funding sources. So um, that's on the next slide. Uh, so OpenSIM and the webinar series are supported by several grants from the NIH, including an NIH grant that funds our National Center for Simulation and Rehab Research. Uh, next slide. Uh, thank you again for the great discussion. You can find more information about the NCSRR, upcoming events, and other resources on our website. Uh, and we also ask that you fill out the survey that will appear in a pop-up window at the end of the webinar. Uh, this information will help us improve our webinar series and uh, choose future topics for webinars as well. Uh, so thank you to everyone again. 